Next week, uh, we'll be looking at 1 Corinthians 15 and thinking about the resurrection, the implications of the resurrection, and after that, beginning a series in 1 Peter, uh, if you want to be uh, reading ahead for those. Uh, This morning, Deuteronomy 6, uh, verses 1 through 9, and I'll say a word uh, after we read about why, why I've chosen this passage this morning. This is God's holy, infallible word. So give careful attention to it. This is uh, Moses speaking uh, for the Lord here. Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And we'll end there uh, for now. Well, in these uh, first three weeks of our uh, isolation from each other, uh, largely, uh, my goal has been to choose passages that might uh, speak particularly to um, these very un- unusual circumstances and, and give some uh, encouragement uh, particularly to this time. That's my goal again uh, today. And I have in mind today uh, how we grow spiritually. Um, God has given, we need to remember, God has given us means. Uh, he's given particular means for His church to grow in faith, to grow in love. Uh, to grow in holiness. So he's given us uh, prayer to speak with him. He's given uh, fellowship together. He's given uh, singing praise and and singing meditations of his truth and given the sacraments, of course, as as assurances of his promises. Um, He's given, uh, of course, especially his word and the preaching of his word. And and, And each of these have his promises attached to them. That, that's the point with the, the means of grace. These are the means God has given that He has promised by which to grow us, uh, to maintain and to strengthen our faith. And so we must use these means to feed our faith, to grow our faith. And uh, just like you can't wish yourself to a full stomach or to a healthy body, you have to eat food, eat good food, um, So we must use the nourishment that God provides. And as the church, we're discipled through these things, through prayer and the Word and so on, uh, in a number of ways. Uh, We use these personally, in our personal lives, together as families, but also, very significantly, uh, corporately. Right? We we grow together uh, corporately. Uh, When we gather for worship on the Lord's Day, um, or we gather for Bible studies, or go to conferences, or have other opportunities for fellowship and, and study and prayer together. And these times of corporately going together, growing together, are especially important and, and meaningful. They provide uh, mutual encouragement and, and mutual accountability, um, and, and a sharing of wisdom, and so on. Uh, but but it's this aspect, this this corporate together aspect of growing our faith. Um, that, that is uh, somewhere between very difficult and impossible right now, right? Largely, and, and for, for the foreseeable future, it seems. Um, that The isolation we're experiencing, then, I think, uh, extraordinarily highlights uh, the need for discipleship uh, in our homes, then. Um, and in these weeks and months at home, we need to give special attention to the means of grace in the home, and, and we, we can do that personally. We always should be doing this, of course, uh, personally, but I'm, I'm thinking particularly uh, um, this morning of, of families um, and whoever is part of your household, um, uh, the need to disciple our children especially as well. And this passage has much to say 
about that discipleship in the home, about uh, families or couples, whatever your circumstance is, uh, growing in love, growing in, in commitment and faith in the Lord um, together in the home. Uh, another thing that makes this study relevant uh, today, today more broadly, not just in light of our um, distance from one another and, and experiencing this virus and so on, is, is just a, a major emphasis in I mean, Western Christianity on, on individual religion, on, on individual um, salvation and individual relationship with the Lord. Certainly we have that. Um, we each have an individual relationship with the Lord and are, are saved individually. But the Bible, uh, in the Bible, there's a great emphasis on, on the corporate nature uh, as well and, and God's covenant with a people. And, and not only the thinking of the church as a whole or our congregation as a whole, uh, but God also speaks of and, and deals particularly with and makes promises to families, uh, to families, and uh, with an eye often to, to the past and to the future in terms of our families, um, uh, generation after generation. That's one of the ways, one of the primary ways that God cares for and provides for uh, his people is through families uh, and is in the home. And so that, that's been a theme uh, in Deuteronomy here. If we were to have read the first several chapters, we would have heard that. In, in chapter 4, for example, it says, Because he, because God loved your fathers and chose their offspring after them and brought you out of Egypt with his own presence by his great power, therefore you shall keep his commands, that it may go well with you and your children after you. So there's keeping in mind your fathers, and now you and your children and their children. Um, this eye to the, the past, the present, the future as, as one group, one uh, family. In Deuteronomy 5, we read, uh, Not with our fathers did the Lord make this covenant. And he's speaking of the covenant at Sinai when God met with his people at Sinai. And, if, and, and really, literally, that was their fathers. It was the previous generation. Um, but Moses says it wasn't with your fathers, it was with you who are all here alive today, he says. The Lord spoke with you face to face at the mountain. It's not just something in the past, but God has generations and families uh, in mind uh, in his covenant. And then that continues here, that this concern for families and children. In chapter 6, verse 2 says, So that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God. So, uh, my point is we, we also uh, should be mindful of God's promises, his dealing with uh, families, with, with households, with generations uh, in our discipleship. And the whole goal of this, in this chapter of this learning, this remembering, this obeying, is summarized in verse 5, uh, which is, is well known. We find it in the New Testament as well. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. And with all your, your might. Uh, and and the, the corporate means of grace that we usually enjoy are a big part of, of uh, working towards that goal, loving the Lord more and more fully. Uh, but certainly that begins in the home. And so then the rest of this chapter here, Deuteronomy 6, is concerned with that. With seeing this love for and this commitment to the Lord um, on the hearts, verse 6, of, of all the members in the family, uh, especially passing it on to, to children as well. So how can we do this faithfully? How, can, how is discipleship in the family, discipleship in the home uh, described here in this chapter? I, I want to look at five aspects of it, particularly uh, focusing on verses 7 through 9. So we're looking at, at verses 7 through 9. And, and I'm, I'm addressing particularly this morning, uh, particularly parents, um, maybe even more particularly fathers, husbands, as you uh, lead, have responsibility to lead in these things in your homes. But I'm, I'm not excluding anyone um, in, in my, my thoughts here, and I cert certainly think the Word of God here is applicable to all. I have in mind uh, future parents, those of you who aren't parents yet. Um, these are important things to think about. I have in mind children. Uh, as you need to understand the importance of and support your parents in what they're trying to do uh, in your home. 
uh, certainly applicable to couples, to singles, whatever your, your circumstance uh, is as you pursue your love for God uh, in your personal life and home as well. And, and just keep in mind, these instructions of God are for your benefit. These are a gift of his grace uh, to us. And so I encourage you to examine yourself honestly uh, this morning. How is the Holy Spirit perhaps graciously challenging you to be more faithful, more biblical uh, in your home, uh, fostering and, and passing on even uh, faith and hope uh, in the Lord and love for the Lord. Uh, and, and especially, again, in this time uh, when we're largely away from each other, how can you faithfully put spiritual food on the table, uh, as it were, each, each day. Uh, let's look at these five, five descriptions of uh, discipleship in the home here. Uh, let's read verses 7 through 9 again. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So number one in your outline, the first way this uh, discipleship within our families is described is that it's diligent and purposeful. It's to be diligent and purposeful. Uh, verse 7 says, uh, diligently. And that's an, an interesting um, Hebrew word there. It's usually translated, uh, usually has the meaning to sharpen. Like literally to sharpen a tool, to sharpen a sword, say. Um, and, and speaks of that, that careful, precise repetition that it takes to sharpen something, to sharpen a sword, for example. It's, it's used figuratively of uh, tongues that are sharpened uh, to, to say mean things and hurt other people. And it's used figuratively as is, it is here uh, to instruct children. Uh, and you can see how the, the literal meaning moves into the idiomatic one of, of sharpening our children, focusing them, um, preparing them carefully, precisely, um, pointing them. Uh, and, and that implies being uh, purposeful, right? diligent and purposeful. It's a, it's a hands-on approach is, is apply, implied here, an intentional teaching of our children. And, and so... Uh, it, it implies something other than just you know, hoping that our families would uh, pick up on a, a vibrant and trusting and, and deep faith in God and knowledge of His Word and obedience to it and applying it to all kinds of complexities in our life. It's not just hoping that they would pick up on that just by being around the family, just by watching your example, by going to Sunday school. And all, all these things are very important as well. Uh, but stopping there is to be sort of like leaving a sword in the shed you know, near the sharpening stone, hoping that over the years it would get you know, banged around and might bump into the sharpening stone enough times to get sharpened. Or, or maybe someone else will just come along and do it for you. Right? you know, it, it wouldn't really happen that way. So God calls us to diligent, purposeful teaching uh, of his, his word and his ways uh, to our children, or encouraging each other between spouses in, in the home as well. Secondly, uh, this kind of discipleship is uh, regular and consistent. Regular and consistent. Uh, that's, that's implied by uh, diligence, right? Tools don't stay sharp. You have to keep sharpening them. Uh, but it's also explicit here in verse 7. When Moses says, uh, when you lie down, when you rise up. So it speaks of, of this regular pattern of, of speaking of the Lord's ways and, and teaching uh, his, his commands and His grace. Routine time. So speaking of the Lord with your families to be a, a routine part of your life as much as lying down and, and getting up in the morning. And we all know that um, you know, responsibilities are easier when they are routine that way, when they, when they have a scheduled time and, and a scheduled habit. This is how we do a lot of things, uh, I trust. It's how we do meals, uh, brushing your teeth, doing chores, all, all kinds of things, probably. Um, th these verses speak also of, of going beyond more formal and, and routine and scheduled um, discipleship. Uh, when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, this is, is just speaking of, of any time, anywhere you are, whether you're at home, whether you're out and about, 
Uh, it's always appropriate, it's always time uh, to be discipling your children, looking for those opportunities. Uh, it's to be part of your family's life, any time, any place. Um, not just re- uh, you know, relegated to segments of your life uh, merely, but understood as, as part of who you are as a family, uh, wherever you are. Not that you would uh, constantly or always be talking of, of the Lord or teaching something specific. We have many other things that we need to do as well. Uh, but any time is, is an appropriate time it's to, to fill our light. This is really the, the third point that I'm bleeding into already, that, that faith and, and God's Word are, are, are in your family life central and permeating. So that's number three, that they are central and permeating. Uh, look at verse 8 and 9. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. That is that God's law, God's promises, His, uh, the person of God uh, is, is to be with you all the time. Um, you to have reminders and be reminded of Him uh, all the time. Uh, that's, that's part of the point of, of being a sign on your hand. Your hands are always with you. You always see your hands. Uh, before I had a, a smartphone, I used to write on the back of my hand all the time. I literally had a, a list going all the time in, in pen of uh, you know, thing, place I need to be, things I needed to remember, things that I needed to do. Um, and, and the point is that th- these are supposed to be all over your family's life. So whether you are, uh, you know, in a time of, uh, or an occasion to give thanks, or you come into some trouble or something that's sad, you, you, you uh, bring God's word to bear, or it's a time of discipline, and you bring God's word to bear to that, or even a time of fun, uh, you give glory to God. Uh, there's been debate historically about whether these commands here about binding um, God's words to your hand and your forehead is, is a literal command for God's people, or uh, is it figurative? And uh, you probably know, maybe even from the Gospels, that um, some of the Israelites uh, took these commands literally, and, and a few uh, Jews do still today. And so the, the mention of that in the New Testament is these frontals here, or phylacteries, as they're called, or it's literally a, a little wooden box that uh, you, you write little scriptures on and put them in the box and, and tie it to your forehead. Um, and that, that was obviously a, a literal application of this, uh, a literal physical application, uh, not necessarily a, a bad one at all, right? Still, still symbolic, right? You're not, you know, not taking those out and reading them probably, but uh, it could be a reminder of keeping God's word uh, front and center, right? Now, God... Or, Jesus uh, criticized the Pharisees for doing this just for show, right? To show how, how holy they were and how particular they were about God's word. And that was, that was not the right way to do it. But I think the, the figurative sense is really the one that's, that, that's most important here. That, that the word of God will be a part of every, every part of your life, every level of your life. And so uh, binding them to your hands, to your foreheads would speak of your, your, your personal life, your individual life. And it's to be part of your family life as well, written on your doorposts, part of your household, right? And then uh, part of our, our interaction with society as well, uh, at the gates, on your gates, it says here as well. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 11 is a passage that says something very similar, very similar encouragement, beginning in verse 18. You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in your house, when you're walking by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So very very similar statements there. Just the word of God and your faith and your relationship to the Lord and the implications of his law in your life are all a part of your life. Throughout the day, daily, um, at, at various times, we uh, just finished a series through Proverbs one through nine, and we came across uh, very similar statements there uh, in the early chapters of Proverbs. Chapter three: Do not let truth and mercy leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Uh, or chapter six: 
Uh, My child, guard the commands of your father. Bind them on your heart continually. Fasten them around your neck. All right, so, you know, we have, probably many of us have fairly literal application of these things. If you have a uh, a verse of scripture hanging on your wall somewhere at home, or maybe you have our memory verse, um, you know, pinned on your mirror or, or up on the fridge. Uh, we have things like that. And, and as long as they're not uh, merely symbolic, merely decorative in our homes, they, they uh, serve to, to help us to, to follow this command, right? Um, and to keep God's word and his person and his promises uh, in front of us. Uh, and there are many other you know, applications of these instructions and keeping God's word central in our lives, just bringing, bringing the Lord to mind and his word to mind, bringing him to discussion in our families uh, throughout the day, um, taking opportunity to instruct and remind uh, our kids uh, at home or, or even when we're out and about. Um, maybe you, you pray before you eat, before, before a meal. Here's an example of that. Or when you pray before traveling, um, or you, you uh, bring scripture to bear when you're disciplining uh, your kids or have opportunity to encourage a spouse or, or something like that. And you're thinking, how, how can you have the word of God um, all over your family's life? And a fourth aspect of how this uh, discipleship in the home is described here is that, that parents are, are able and, and always ready to do this. We're we're to be always ready uh, as disciples of each other. Uh, The command to teach uh, implies an ability to do so, so that parents or or spouses uh, themselves have loved the Word of God and studied the Word of God and and made it part of their life. So you know what you're talking about. You can give some instruction from the Bible or some encouragement from God's Word. You can answer questions. Again, one of the purposes of of carefully knowing and obeying the scriptures uh, here is so that you would be able to teach your children. And and I would encourage you just to be mindful of that, even even applying that more broadly than in all of our study and all of our reflection and and learning um, the the word of God, that we would have in mind, in part, uh, in part, how would I communicate this to others? How could I minister these truths to other peoples? How would I, how would I explain this to someone else? Right? Whether that's your, your children or your spouse or, or someone else in your life that you have in mind. Um, I think that should be part of how we, how we hear and how we learn and how we read. I've, I've heard the objection uh, a couple of times uh, to the idea of reading Christian books, to reading books on you know, Christian living and, and so on. Well, you know, the, the idea is, well, I, I feel like when I read things like that, I already know these truths. You know, I already know these basic truths, right? And that's, that's probably true. That's, not, uh, that's God's blessing. Um, but I think if, if we're thinking about how would I, how can I be teaching others? How can I be discipling others? Um, there's still a lot to learn. Are, are, am I an expert? Am I so expert in, in these um, in these basic truths that I can articulate them uh, to all kinds of different circumstances and different people at different levels, different places in their faith. Uh, I think that's where uh, one place where we have a lot to learn and a lot to reflect on. Um, and, and certainly as we think about discipling um, those in our household. Um, again, this is the emphasis uh, often in the Pentateuch, Deuteronomy 32, from the end of Deuteronomy. Take to heart all the words which I am warning you today so that you can command them to your children, that they may be careful to do all the words of this law. Uh, 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 and a parallel in the New Testament will be Paul's words in Romans 15, verse 14, where he's uh, telling the Roman Christians how he's, he's praying for them. He knows that they are, he says, filled with all knowledge, able to instruct one another. Part of the blessing of their being filled with the knowledge of God's word is that they are able to instruct or, or admonish one another in these things. And certainly that begins in our homes. And then fifthly, uh, discipleship in the home is always to be aimed at the heart. It's always to be aimed at the heart. Uh, there are several, uh, several times in the Old Testament where we have a scenario like 
uh, the one in, in verse 20 here, Deuteronomy 6, verse 20, and, and following. We didn't read this part uh, yet, but it's, it's uh, in, in verse 20, when your son asks you in time to come, so it, it's envisioning uh, a child coming to the parents saying, Dad, why, why are we doing this? Why do we do this thing, things this way? Why do, why do you have us do this or that? And then it goes on to give an example of a thorough and thoughtful answer and an explanation uh, to, to your child. And I think this is in, instructive for us uh, in large part because it's easy for us to, uh, in explaining things to our children, explaining why we live the way we do, why we have the rules we do in our households, just to say, because I said so. Right? Just, you just need to obey, right? Or, or maybe if we, we skip over, if you were to read here, we skip over verses 21 through 23. We skip to verse 24 and basically just said, because God commands it. Right? That's a, that's a step better, at least. And in one sense, that's enough reason. Uh, but the Bible gives us, the Lord gives us many other uh, reasons, uh, uh, rich things to teach our children about uh, the life of faith. And so uh, the explanation, the example explanation Moses gives here begins with, uh, son, he, he brought us out of Egypt. God saved us. He gave us this undeserved and, and uh, incredible salvation. And we can do the same with our children, right? Same in our homes we, as we teach them the gospel. This is because of the gospel, because of how God has saved us by his grace, and then it goes on, verse 24, it's for our survival. This is, this is the way, son, this is the way, my daughter, of blessing and of real and free and full life that God has provided. That's what obedience to him is. And then verse 25, it will be righteous for us. This is the way of righteousness. This, this is how we live like God and before God and show God to other people. Uh, there are so many ways we can explaining these things to our children. And in all of this, as, as encouragement to a spouse or teaching children, uh, the, the goal is not just to live by some code or just to be uh, respectable uh, to other people. Uh, again, the, the, the goal of, of this whole chapter is verse 5 and 6. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And that is to be on your heart. Verse 6, right? Uh, so when your kids, when your kids come and ask you, why? Dad, why do, we have, why do I have to do that? Why do, we do, why do we do it like this and not like that? Why don't, we, why don't we do this like other people are doing it? What's your answer? Or even when they don't ask that question, uh, how are you doing it? At explaining, at discipling, why, why you order your home the way that you do and spend your time the way that you do? Are you, are you shaping and directing hearts in your household and not just behavior? Are you pointing the people in your household together to live for a God who is gracious and compassionate, who's slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, as we studied last week. Your, your goal for your family is not that you would be respectable in your community. Your, your goal for your family is not that your kids would be getting A's. Or that you would get your kids to college. Your goal is not that your kids would, uh, you know, play the violin and, you know, play tennis and earn lots of money and all kinds of other things. Uh, your goal is verse 5. Right? That your family would love the Lord your God with all your heart and, and mind and, and strength. And, and that may produce all kinds of A's and you know, excellence in all kinds of other areas. But, but these things ought not to be what are up front. And if you are pouring all kinds of resources and time, as I am, as I know many of you are, rightly, uh, into, into these things daily, diligently, into grades and sports and careers and, and all kinds of things, how much more ought you to be doing that? Ought we to be doing that um, toward the Word and the promises of God and the person of God um, in our family life. Psalm 78 states the goal of family life and, and discipleship this way, that the next generation would set their hope in God. Uh, everything needs to be fit into that goal in some way, in, working towards that goal in some way. 
That we would not be merely following a set of, of rules and boundaries, but learning to love God and, and be guided by his, his very character as his children. I want to spend a little time thinking about uh, application of these things. How, how, do we, how do we put this into practice uh, this morning? Um, there, there are many ways that we fulfill all of this in our homes. Okay, So again, verse 7 speaks of uh, you know, when you're at home, when you're out on the way, nighttime, morning time. So in a sense, it's, it's to be a, a part of our lives all the time. Uh, teaching moments, opportunities for prayer, and so on. I think the best way to uh, systematically, regularly, to promote, just as, as one significant application, to promote the things of God regularly, diligently, uh, centrally, uh, aimed at the heart, all the ways that, that Deuteronomy 6, for example, uh, describes this kind of discipleship in our homes, is to have regular family worship, to have regular times of, of family devotions, wh- whatever you want to call that. And you've heard me mention and, and encourage that before in, in application, uh, but I believe it can hardly be encouraged too strongly, or, or the benefit of it um, uh, can hardly be underestimated, and and maybe especially now in our current circumstances, uh, being largely separated from the body of Christ, physically uh, from the church. Um, You know, family, a a time, a regular time of family devotions or family worship used to be a regular part, uh, a common part of of church practice, of of, uh, church piety, especially in Reformed tradition. It's it's no longer widely practiced, so I want to commend it to you um, not because it's laid out uh, explicitly on some page of Scripture exactly what you would do or, or exactly how often, but because I think this is what God intends for our families, for our households. Um, I, I don't know how otherwise we can really fulfill the kind of discipleship in our families that's described, for example, in Deuteronomy chapter 6 uh, and elsewhere. Uh, sometimes that that term, family worship, I think is intimidating um, to to people, or it may just be totally foreign uh, to you, and that's fine. So let me describe what I mean by that, and and then show how it fulfills what we've studied here in Deuteronomy 6. A time of of family devotions is simply, uh, what I mean by that is the whole family gathering together uh, under the leadership of the the parents, of course, uh, to worship God together as a family, uh, regularly. I don't mean by that is, is, some, is a 90-minute worship service, uh, something formal or long, but a brief time for simple uh, instruction and prayer and singing. Uh, very, very simple, but important. Uh, so the time is, can be used, you know, reading a bit from, from God's Word, or maybe from a devotional, and uh, maybe some explanation and, and application, uh, simple application. is a good opportunity to ask some questions uh, of your kids as well, interact with them, uh, and then having a time of prayer, a great opportunity to uh, teach your kids how to pray and what to pray for, uh, and then uh, singing a, a song of praise or two as well. And so I, I think this is the best way that we can be, again, there are many ways to apply what we've studied here this morning, but the best way to be diligent and purposeful um, a way to make all of these elements of teaching our children about serving and worshiping God and uh, make them systematic and careful, uh, uh, sharpening our children and our, our, ourselves um, intentionally in our homes, uh, not just haphazardly. Um, it's the best way to be regular and consistent. Uh, it, it's a, a point of accountability for, for parents, for families. Uh, The great thing to do every day, it doesn't have to be uh, every day, there aren't rules about that, but even even a few times a week, um, be a great start, a great pattern, a habit that demonstrates to to your whole family the the priority of these things, of of, um, relationship with the Lord. It's the best way to practice making the Word of God central uh, in your family, part of you, uh, making it available. Uh, in your family, in your hearts? What, what better way, figuratively, to write the law of God on your hands or write it on your, write it on your hearts uh, than to read it daily, to, to think about it uh, together, 
Um, and, and most of all, in terms of memorizing, to, to sing it even, uh, to sing together, um, to practice our memory verse that, that we always have um, together. Um, to mark, it's a way to mark your family as, uh, as Joshua did. Right? As for me and my household, we will worship the Lord. Uh, our household, we are going to worship the Lord. Uh, the best way to answer questions um, and, and daily direct your children to Christ and, and point, your hearts, uh, point their hearts to Him. Uh, there could be many reasons we might not um, commit ourselves to some practice like this, to, to regular times of worship or devotions as a family. Um, you know, some people never didn't grow up with that example or that practice or, or uh, have never even heard of it. Um, maybe for many of us who just feel uh, particularly uh, busy, busyness is, uh, I know, uh, makes, makes something like this very difficult. Uh, but I just remind us all that you, you have to decide what's important, right? And, and in fact, we all have, we all do every day. Uh, we have to keep redeciding in a sense. What is important? What, what priorities do we want to set for our homes? So we all fit our priorities. Whatever we say they are, we all fit our priorities into every day. What we do is what our priorities actually are. You know, we don't go a week or let alone a few hours, I don't, without eating, uh, for example. Right? And, and understand uh, that you know, having a practice like this is not, not the only way to bring up children in the Lord. That is to say, if, if, if you don't have this as a regular practice, it doesn't mean that you're not, uh, you know, living out Deuteronomy 6 in, in other ways. Um, uh, I, I, would think, I, I would suggest to you it's, it, it's more limited, uh, but it certainly doesn't mean that, that you're failing in this. But I do want to encourage you to consider this kind of devotional practice as families, um, as, as invaluable and as, as a matter of, of the best way uh, to, in, to um, live out obedience to God's word here and uh, experiencing the blessing of it, experiencing the promises that God attaches uh, to his means of grace um, for growth and, and so on. So I, I commend to you, uh, parents, future parents, spouses, what, whatever your circumstance is, uh, a regular practice of, of gathering together for times of, of devotions. And just challenge you to consider whether, whether we're somehow uh, better fulfilling the gracious instructions of God here and elsewhere in his word um, w- without some kind of regular and routine scheduled um, use of the means of grace. Uh, again, I think we can hardly overestimate the, the seemingly uh, infinite benefits of um, this kind of an application. We, we have um, a couple of little booklets here on family worship. Uh, one by Jason Halopoulos. He lists a number of the benefits of family worship. Uh, among them, simply that it, it glorifies God, certainly, in your home. It centers your home on Christ. Uh, it binds your family together. It's a means of bringing your family together. It uh, reinforces spiritual headship in your home, wherever that lies, and it allows for systematic discipleship of your kids, um, and, and we could go on. Uh, but however you live out the calling of, of Deuteronomy 6, pray and ask for God's grace um, and, and the diligence that you need to faithfully point your household to Him. The, the most important thing for, for each of our families, for each of our households, uh, is that they would glorify God, and that comes when we love the Lord our God with all of our hearts and all of our souls and all of our mights when, we're, when that's our pursuit, when we're growing in that. Uh, so how can you diligently share that together? How can you perhaps pass that on to your children, um, especially uh, in light of our, our circumstances of being apart uh, these weeks uh, and months as well? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you again this week for uh, these instructions and encouragements from your word. We thank you for uh, your guidance in showing us how we can uh, really live uh, in fostering our, our love for you, our commitment to you, our uh, life-sustaining um, relationship with you. I pray that, that we would be encouraged 
uh, to do that in our homes, especially now, Lord, as we're apart from the, the mutual encouragement and accountability that we uh, normally uh, experience, uh, at least week by week on the Lord's Day and, and in other opportunities. Uh, Lord, help us to be encouraged and, and spurred on by the promises that you attach to your means of grace, the, the blessings that you promise to give uh, those of us who have children, give us an eagerness to pass on the priorities of these things in our homes. Uh, Lord, be with each of us um, wherever we are this morning. Um, sustain our faith uh, and even increase it, we pray, in the name and for the sake of Christ.